Thank you so much. Okay, everyone happy now? Good, good. All right, so we were on the idea that uh, we have these ideologies that are committed to growth and development, and that this has enabled very exploitative relations. Uh, the next point I want to make that it's quite clear that across this spectrum, there are models of sustainability that actually compete with each other. So even when efforts are made to adopt models to the far left of the spectrum on the ecological end, if you like, euphemisms about trade-offs, prioritizing economic sustainability at the far right tend to translate into unsustainable practices. More subtly, <laughs> More often and more subtly, even the models of sustainability that are at the more inclusive end of this continuum, while expressive of very genuine concern for non-human interests, still rely on dualistic concepts in which nature is cast as an often feminized other to masculinized, masculinized culture. And this results in ideas about stewardship, human guardianship, that is though they're putatively benign, are still quite patriarchal and in their assumptions about human, uh, human exceptionalism. So what you get is humans positioned as kind of like senior managers in charge of a subjected an implicitly passive non-human domain. And I would contend that as long as visions of sustainability are dominated by dualistic and anthropocentric assumptions, it is more or less inevitable that non-human interests will continue to be overridden. So a key question in any attempt to achieve more sustainable life ways is how to challenge the underlying assumptions of nature as other and the inequitable relations created by this othering. And critiques of conceptual dualism have come from several, sometimes interrelated directions. And one is the lively intellectual debates whose roots lie in early romanticism and the study of ecology, which seeks to relocate humankind within ecosystems and to foreground the connectivity of living kinds. And some examples come from the material scientists. So if you go back to the 1920s, for example, you get Vladimir Bernadsky's uh, early notion of the biosphere, which imagined a global living system. You get evolutionary biologist Lynn Margulis' version of a symbiotic planet and her collaborator James Lovelock's vision of Gaia and so forth. And one of my favorites, I think you'll like this one, it's because it focuses on water, is paleontologist Diana and Mark McMenamin's vision of the hypersea. Does that ring a bell with anybody? And I'll explain. This reminds us that uh, even when living kinds emerged from private oceans and hauled themselves up onto dry land to inhabit the terrestrial sphere, they brought the ocean with them. Uh, they brought uh, a, a dependence upon water and a connection through water that brings up onto the terrestrial domain what they then describe as a hypersea. And they underline a material reality that water flows through all the cells and bodies of every living organism and connects us all to each other. More recently, an influential debate has emerged from what's generally described as new materialism, which challenges the notion of homo faber, man as maker, acting upon the world, and uh, it highlights the agency of the non-human domain and its co-creative role in shaping shared life worlds. And this has been criticized a little bit for obscuring the devastating impact of human activities uh, on the material environment and thus absolving humans of responsibility. But it's obviously important not to lose sight of that, but also to be reminded that this is very far from being a one-way street. And the non-human world can, of course, act upon humankind with considerable force. But more to the point, new materialism highlights a reality that every human activity, every environment is dynamically co-composed by non-human others, by the activities of other species and by the material properties and behaviors of all the objects and systems that compose the physical environment. And by acknowledging and valorizing this co-creativity, there is a potential there, I think, for thinking differently about human 
non-human relations. And these perspectives that underline the material interdependencies of all living kinds have been helpful, but as is demonstrated by ideas about human exceptionalism, uh, they are also always social political relations of power and the social aspect of human engagements with the non-human domain and the active role of all participants have been usefully usefully foregrounded in anthropological research on human animal relations which initially focused on domestication of long-term species we saw this beautiful film yesterday of domesticated sheep and their very intimate relationships with with the shepherds uh, but it and this has encompassed our understanding of things like domestic pets as persons or kin with centrally important lives, uh, centrally importance in human lives. And this comes hand in hand with ethical debates about animal rights and inhumane treatment of animal and so forth. And more recently, multi-species ethnographies, for example, by people like Anna Tsing, have, have sought to make very imaginative forays into non-human lives to consider their experience of social and material relations with humans and with each other. And all of these approaches come together to highlight the co-creative nature of non-human beings and ecosystems as actors in human lives. And this movement towards less anthropocentric perspectives is helpfully informed by ethnography, bringing into these debates alternative worldviews of many indigenous communities and more recent years by the indigenous communities themselves, such as the Kogi, of course, who've been talking about what Younger Brother is doing to the planet for quite a while. Now, obviously, indigenous worldviews about engagements with the non-human domain are far from being culturally homogenous. And it's also very important not to uh, romanticize indigenous life ways as environmental organizations have done and as the awful avatar does in spades. Uh, but the ethnographic evidence suggests that place-based communities who've maintained intimate long-term relationships with place do share some important ideas and values and provide some very lively alternative models about uh, to, to, to dominant visions of sustainability. And the key characteristic that I want to draw attention to of indigenous life worlds is that they present indivisible worldviews that are not characterized by sharp dualism and assumptions about human exceptionalism. So for the Arctic and Fiona Broaden's ethnographic word with the Yupik Arctic groups describes a worldview in which the elders say all living kinds of persons and there are no others. Persons may shift between human and non-human form, and human activities entail an ongoing dialogue and collaboration between sentient beings. And many indigenous societies venerate non-human ancestral beings who are central to their stories of origin and retain an active role in sentient cultural landscapes. So for example, uh, Maori beliefs valorize livers, rivers as living ancestors, Te Awatupua, and they've recently won legal battles to have them acknowledged as legal persons with concomitant rights. And I'll come back to this example. And a small comparative example from my own ethnographic research might be useful. I've spent many years working with very diverse groups of water users in river catchments in Australia. And this includes the originally European pastoralists, extractive industries, domestic and recreational communities, and those charged with uh, water supply and management. And they generally share a conventional vision of nature as other and historically in Australia, this has been quite an adversarial relationship of outback battlers battling hostile nature and aiming to achieve quite repressive patriarchal control over unruly feminized nature and casting the environment as a set of material resources to be exploited. And in the early history of settlement, of course, there was a similarly hostile and adversarial engagement with the indigenous community. But focusing on engagement with the non-human domain, Queensland has seen a long process of forest and wetland clearance, first for farming and more recently for urban expansion. A mining boom in the late 1800s established widespread 
extractive activities. And these developments all encourage major infrastructural developments, in particular the building of dams and irrigation schemes to intensify the cattle industry, arable farming, and to supply a growing urban population. And as a result, the extraction of water from aquifers and rivers has risen steadily with thousands of water walls puncturing, puncturing the great artesian basin and are causing an alarming fall in its water levels. And over abstraction from rivers is a norm. For example, Queensland is the home of the very notorious Cubby Station, uh, a property with dams so large they can be seen from space and its wheat and cotton production rely on diverting a major percentage of the water that would otherwise flow into the Darling River and thus into the Murray-Darling Basin. And as this implies in Queensland, prevailing views on sustainability are squarely at the end of the spectrum devoted to ensuring economic sustainability, in particular for a powerful mining and farming industry who've long dominated state and to some degree national politics as the backbone of the economy. And this, pol this political commitment to uh, sustaining unsustainable extractive practices is exacerbated by a disjunction between local and global decision making. So while their activities have major material impacts at a local level, most mining, irrigation and large scale farming operations in Queensland are owned by large transnational corporations who have little or no local accountability. And they're protected by the mantra that they're the backbone of the economy and there's no doubt that they are an important part of it but they've been allowed to operate with very little restraint there is a similar disembedding as polanyi puts it in the creation of virtual water markets where water can actually be traded away from the land entirely leaving what are known as dry blocks but recent decades have brought more diversity, a burgeoning tourist industry focused on valorizing wildlife and unspoilt land and waterscapes. And so this has uh, created a more diverse population and of course immigration has contributed to that. There's now much greater social and political diversity and a growing acceptance of the environmental organizations that when I first went to Australia in the eighties were still just bloody greenies, you know. And it's still a highly conservative state. The primary industries remain central and so forth. So the impact to environmental groups on business as usual has been limited. So there's discussions now about how to maintain minimum flows in rivers so that they can just kind of scratch by in ecological terms. But this is largely focused on maintaining uh, that classic view of ecosystem services for human needs and interests. Uh, so what might an indigenous voice, which is now rising in Australia, bring to discussions on sustainability? Since achieving citizenship in the 1960s, nearly 200 years after the colonial invasion, Aboriginal Australians have sought to reclaim their homelands to critique the colonial and ongoing exploitation of resources and damage to local ecosystems, and also to promote their own beliefs and values. And since the 1980s, I've worked with Indigenous communities on the Mitchell River in Cape York in far North Queensland, and also in South Queensland on the Brisbane River uh, in the Brisbane catchment area. So there's a little bit of a map to locate where we are. And in Cape York, this meant working with an Indigenous community containing several language groups, the Yuyurant, the Kunjan, and the Kokobera near the estuary of the Mitchell River. And this is a former mission reserve area um, held in deed of grant and trust now by the community and their traditional homelands lie there and in the surrounding cattle stations and what was the Alice Mitchell, Alice Mitchell National Park now reclaimed and renamed by the Kunjan traditional owners. And like other indigenous land language groups in Australia, the groups living in Koenyama maintained as hunter gatherers for many millennia prior to the colonial invasion, which forced them to seek safety under mission control or to provide uh, unpaid labor for the surrounding cattle stations in the term, in that form of stock work, domestic service or um, concubinage if they wanted to remain on their own country. Now, these traditional lifeways clearly had some impact on megafauna and long term fire management created some important changes in the Australian environment, but they were fundamentally highly sustainable. 
populations were controlled at a level reflecting the ecosystem. So this part of Australia with its wetlands and savannah is more densely populated than the desert regions. And economic practices were very deliberately low key and resource collection was always pegged at levels that would be sustainable. And there was little or no intensification just domiculture around campsites, a few small fish weirs, but very little material interference with, with weight. And it was considered to be a completely non-acceptable thing to do to impede water flows or divert them in any way. And this country was traditionally owned collectively by all members of the community, and they maintained a circular economy based on an extensive exchange network between communities all over Australia and indeed further afield and along extended trade routes and it was um, a very egalitarian society in that its gerontocratic governance is held by all of the elders and their authority is is upheld by secret sacred knowledge they've acquired over time and through various rites of passage so in becoming elders people become bosses of particular areas of country and this is uh, upheld by a particular set of beliefs and values. So we come to the rainbow serpent. In, an, in indigenous communities throughout Australia, the rainbow serpent personifies and manifests the powers of water. It is seen as the major ancestral being, being the source of all of the other human and non-human beings who were generated during the dream time and who formed the landscape and then returned into the land. And a key point is that these ancestral beings were largely non-human in their form, and they highlight the lack of demarcation between human and non-human beings. So from within the land, held in its rivers and aquifers and seas, the rainbow seven spewed or spat out all of the totemic beings that um, formed the landscape and then they sat down and they remain in a sentient landscape. So when I go out to do cultural mapping with indigenous elders, they'll call out to the ancestral beings. Oh, we brought Ronnie here to take some photographs. Is that all right? That kind of thing. Uh, and so that you get the sense of a landscape that's very much inhabited by watchful and thoughtful and responsive ancestral beings. So that when the boss of a particular piece of clan estate dies, the local water hole might dry up in grief, that kind of thing. And the rainbow circle serpent, I said circle there quite deliberately really, because it upholds traditional and uh, spatial and social arrangements. So each person's spirit is believed to emerge from the rainbow serpent held within the, the land. Uh, and that brings them into a clan estate in a home place that they'll be identified with inalienably forever. And that carries rights to that estate and a responsibility to care for it. And then when people die, having lived a life becoming older and closer to the ancestral beings, they are returned ritually to their home place in the landscape to be reunited with the pool of ancestral force to re-enter the non-material domain and be reunited with the rainbow. And the rainbow serpent, again, manifesting the powers of water, generates all living kinds out of the land and it ensures the seasonal cycles of production and reproduction and traditional increased rituals valorize this role and encourage it to produce particular resources. The rainbow serpent is also seen as a source of consciousness and a body of traditional knowledge, which is described as the law that defines all aspects of traditional life. And the totemic ancestors that it generated uh, depict every aspect of hunter-gatherer life. So it's like a kind of blueprint on how to live successfully as a hunter-gatherer. And it's a vast lexicon of traditional knowledge. And this is held in the land through song lines and particular sacred sites. And this body of knowledge is carried on through art and ritual and stories and performance. So as the source of the law, the rainbow serpent, this personification of water is a major authority figure and it's willing to act quite punitively if, um, if, if um, people transgress the law. Uh, so it responds, for example, to the incursion of strangers into sacred sites by swallowing people sometimes or bringing floods and so forth. And it will ensure that somebody failing to respect the law will become ill or incur an injury. 
But for Indigenous Australians, as the overarching, literally overarching ancestral being, it is fundamentally beneficent. It generates all living kinds and supports their life ways. Now, what I hope comes through in this very tiny ethnographic sketch is that this is a worldview that is populated by sentient generative ancestral beings, and it upholds a vision of human non-human relations that doesn't draw any kind of sharp line between humans and others, but it, which instead fully acknowledges and respects the co-creative role of the non-human beings and the material elements and demands that they are treated with concern and respect. So the non-human domain is very much an active, reciprocal, equal and respected partner in this composition of a shared human and non-human life. And as this implies, this is a fully integrated system of knowledge. There's no specialized area, no division between economic and ecological, social or religious. All are metaphorically pooled in the body of the rainbow serpent. So it's not difficult to see why the colonial appropriation of Aboriginal country and the radical impositions made by European settlers were so traumatizing to Indigenous Australians. Their principles of sustainability intrinsically opposed to exploitative practices, the disruption of ecosystems and interference in the flow of waterways. And there's great anxiety about land degradation and the pollution of rivers and aquifers and sea country. So although they've been forced to accept extractive activities in their homelands, and sometimes they pragmatically accept that this does bring contemporary economic opportunities, they remain very concerned about mining that drills down into the ancestral domain, posing an existential threat to the rainbow serpent and therefore to their own well-being. So it's entirely logical, in fact, that the rainbow serpent, exotic though it may seem from here, should have a key role in Indigenous Australians' efforts to reclaim their traditional ownership of land and water, and an increasingly important role in contemporary critiques of colonial and neoliberal exploitation of their homelands. And this was very nicely interest, uh, illustrated just in last summer in a legal case that I was involved in, which you might have read about in the international press. And it involves a major mining company, Santos, who was involved in undersea exploration for hydrocarbons and the indigenous community living on the Tiwi Islands, which as you can see is just off the coast of Darwin, about 25 miles. And these are very tiny islands. There's just two of them. Uh, they're only about 3000 square miles altogether. And the indigenous people are uh, numbering a couple of thousand, nine totemic clans. And they are of course, heavily reliant upon what they see as sea country. And I should stress that there really isn't any kind of division between sea and land country in, in Aboriginal terms and the marine resources that it contains. And Santos, initiated a project to drill a number of wells into the Barossa reefs, which lie less than 100 miles northwest of the islands, aiming to extract hydrocarbons and put in a great big undersea pipeline to send them to Darwin, uh, where there's a major gas facility. And in doing so, it was required by law to consult people who had any direct interests that might be affected wasn't required to consult um, the non-human beings, but it was required by law to consult those concerned. And this included the Tiwi Islanders whose sea country would clearly be completely devastated by any kind of oil spill. But in reality, the corporation sent a couple of emails and a very dense technical report to the Northern Land Council and the Tiwi Island Land Council without really fully realizing that Aboriginal councils don't represent any kind of government. They're just representative bodies that act as an interface between indigenous communities and the state and the wider population. And as I noted, indigenous uh, governance is gerontocratic. So the TV Land Council told Santos that they should consult the traditional owners, in other words, the elders of the clans, but they didn't bother. And the TV Islanders, uh, traditional owners, took them to the federal court to argue that they hadn't fulfilled the required consultative process and should therefore stop drilling. And in this case, 
the rainbow serpent, which in the Tiwi Islands has very marine as well as freshwater manifestations, had a central role. So alongside raising concerns about the potential devastation that an oil spill and pollution could have on their whole way of life, one of the key points the Tiwi Islanders made was that based on the extensive undersea song lines uh, created by marine rainbow serpents, who they call Ampigi, and the far ranging movement of other marine totemic species, such as turtles, which is a particularly important one, that their sea country actually extended all the way out to the drill site. And they argued passionately that drilling into the body of the rainbow serpent would injure the serpents and thus their own well being and cause the same serpent to be angry and vengeful and bring harm to the people attacking its domain. And the depiction, this depiction of their beliefs was um, supported by the ethnographic account by produced by their own anthropologist, Gareth Lewis. And I was able to add to this as an independent expert report, another tranche of ethnographic material showing that all the communities along that coast have uh, uh, similar beliefs and describe rainbow serpent song lines, lim linking them as far as Makassar, in fact, uh, an area with which they had long-term trade relations historically. So setting a radical precedence, hence the international coverage of this case, um, the federal court ruled against Santos, slightly surprisingly in Australia, but then we have had a change of, of government, and they ordered a stop to the drilling. And the case went to appeal in November. And once again, the islanders' right to be consulted was upheld. And this is probably as much due to the changing political climate in Australia as it is to any modest ethnographic input that my colleagues and I may have had. But this is a sea change, if you like. And it was, we have now a government committed to ensuring that indigenous voices are not ignored. And uh, this is an exciting development because it sent it set a precedent, it sent to international corporations that they couldn't just trample over indigenous voices and argue as Santos attempted to do in their appeal that Aboriginal belief systems are really just a hobby, as they put it. But what it illustrates most effectively is the capacity of indigenous communities to communicate their beliefs about the non-human domain as an active partner in their lives and to promote their own visions of sustainability in their own ways. Now, in fact, water beings, and now onto my favorite topic, are used for this purpose extensively in contemporary conflicts over water and land. And it's not as strange as it may seem, because given that societies as we know them have worshiped nature for most of human history, Generative water beings like the rainbow serpent are historically ubiquitous. And once you start looking at them, you find they are absolutely everywhere. And they remain central to the belief systems of many indigenous societies. And they embody ideas about the generative and potentially destructive capacities of water and water's power. And they underline the co-creative capacities of the non-human domain, and they pose a very lively challenge to assumptions about anthropocentricity and aspirations for human dominion. So I find them particularly fascinating, and I've recently completed a, completed a, a major comparative study of water beings across time and space. And uh, if you want to know a bit more about this research, as Dan so kindly said, my new book is actually coming out this week, so I'm very excited about this and uh, as we speak. Um, now, and I've brought some flyers for you, I think you mentioned, so another very nice example of water beings making an influential contribution to political arena is across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand, uh, where I did a lot of work with the Maori Council. And here we have Tanifa, which are is, is what you would call uh, a guardian spirit in, in a river, if you like, and also in the sea. And they've been very astutely deployed by local iwis, that is to say tribes, uh, to resist developments that threaten local ecosystems. So in 2009, I assisted the Maori Council with a legal case focused on a, a site called Tanifa Springs, which gives you some sense of how important it was, and their broader efforts to reassert some degree of Maori ownership 
over uh, fresh water. And this went through the Waitangi Tribunal and then through the High Court and then finally the Supreme Court. And the government continued to assert the ownership of the crown, which is one of the reasons that New Zealand hangs on to the crown particularly, but it did enable the renegotiation of um, a co-management agreement, which was probably as much as one could hope for. And it also was intrinsic to this idea is not only beliefs in uh, Taniva in the rivers, but a whole pantheon of non-human ancestral deities. So in Maori belief systems, very briefly, a sky father, Ranganui, an earth mother, Papa Tuanku, produced multiple deities representing every aspect of the non-human environment, including Tane Mahuta, the god of forests and plants, Tangaroa, the god of rivers, lakes, and seas. And within this cosmology, rivers are seen as living ancestors. And it's this vision of ancestral connections between parts of the non-human domain and Maori communities that underlines the now well-known case in which legal personhood was achieved, first for the Uruwera Forest in 2014, then for the Fonganui River in 2017, followed more recently by personhood for Mount Taranaki. And like the totemic ancestors of Aboriginal Australian groups, the assignation of ancestral personhood to forests and rivers and mountains in New Zealand underlines the way in which they and other Indigenous communities conceptualise social identity and the perceptual indivisibility and relative equality of human and non-human beings. And it provides some useful insights into why such worldviews are intrinsically geared towards more respectful and uh, uh, sustainable human, non-human relations. And in New Zealand, the conferment of legal personhood for the Whanganui River and so forth comes with a translation from traditional discourses into contemporary legal rights. And that brings us to the broader question of non-human rights. Now, many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the ongoing international debates about non-human rights and ideas about earth law promoted by legal activists such as Polly Higgins. And this movement has sought to establish ecocide as a crime in the International Court of Criminal Justice on par with the genocide of human groups war crimes and so forth. And it's also sought to place pressure on the United Nations to make a declaration for non-human rights as it did to that provide for human rights in 1948. And the drive to provide legal protection for non-human rights has brought with it a conversation, how can these rights be represented in legal and political fora and through various forms of pan-species democracy? Now, I think it's important to note here that some of these large scale legal rights debates are potentially hegemonic and as demonstrated in New Zealand, create some pressure on indigenous communities to reframe their beliefs in terms that can be considered in contemporary legal and uh, political arena in places like North Queensland. And they talk about this as a pressure to talk the talk. Um, but of course, uh, indigenous people are often by tri lingual and talking the talk in these terms is, is not beyond the bounds. And there are some broadly common goals between legal activism for non-human rights and indigenous activism promoting cultural values that conceptualize relationships with the non-human domain in ways that are, uh, uh, that are very diverse, but uh, so forth. So there's a need as with human rights for very careful balance between efforts to uphold universal rights and respecting local beliefs and values. But the potential to make good use of anthropological methods of cultural translation is obvious, little plug for my own discipline here. And in both New Zealand and Australia, anthropologists have had a key role in helping to broaden European law to encompass indigenous relationships with their homelands and ensure that cultural complexities are not always lost in translation. And this is by no means a one-way street. Indigenous law has actually been a very important influence on legal developments encompassing cultural relations with place and also informing much more broad concepts of cultural and uh, heritage. 
And there's similar potential, I think, for rethinking concepts of sustainability through the lens of indigenous worldviews. And it's learning from these that provides the foundation for some ideas that I have suggested might help us to develop more sustainable engagements with the non-human domain. And this is an approach that I call a reimagined communities, which is a homage, if you like, to Benedict Anderson's classic text on imagined communities. And those of you familiar with it will know right away that this is, a, is um, how he drew attention to the way in which we all imagine the communities that we belong at, in terms of kinship and professional networks and recreational communities, neighborhoods, and so forth. And his work is particularly helpful in articulating ideas about different scales of community, how we all imagine ourselves within quite localized communities, but also within national, international communities of various kinds. Uh, so it's, his work is, is very helpful in that way. And he also, of course, we now participate regularly in virtual communities as a matter of course. So what I've proposed in making use of his work is that we expand that notion that we should reject nature culture dualism and anthropocentricity and extend communal visions to the non-human communities with whom we coexist. Therefore, reimagining human non-human relations on a more indivisible and egalitarian basis. And this is readily illustrated at a local level where it's easy to imagine not only the various human groups in a river catchment area, but also the multiple and diverse species of plants and insects and animals and amphibians and so soil microbes and so forth, as well as the wild and dom domesticated animals that compose local ecosystems. And of course, there's the river itself. But these ideas are also amenable to being scaled up to larger human and non-human populations and planetary ecosystems. So in thinking about this, I have drawn inspiration from indigenous visions of a sentient landscape and the worldviews that I described and from Maori notions of rivers as living ancestors. Because Maori activities on this front provide another very nice example, a very practical example of how this kind of thinking can actually be moved out of abstract ideas into practical deployment. And the establishment of legal personhood for the Fonganui River was followed by the appointment of two members of the local Maori iwi as Toputupua, with a formal responsibility to represent the interests of the river in decision-making processes. Now, of course, the key requirement for any successful model, uh, this is Dorset in the south of England, is that it's readily applicable in diverse cultural and geographic contexts, but can simultaneously engage with local beliefs, practices, and materialities. So in articulating the ideas, I took them somewhere very different on the other side of the planet to Dorset on the River Stour and asked how might this model work in an English cultural landscape, in an English catchment. Now the Stour River runs for about 70 miles from Wiltshire to the south coast, and it has long been a very rich farming area. The Doomsday Book, written in, in uh, 1086, records 66 water mills along its 70 mile course. And it still maintains a, a major dairy industry and very extensive arable farming. And it also enables Wessex water to supply the conurbations of Bournemouth and Poole on the coast. And there are concomitant impacts on the river. A lot of uh, uh, a lack of flow from over abstraction of its upper reaches, a lot of runoff from farming and uncontrolled stormwater, and the resulting eutrophication and, uh, and reduced water quality. And the catchment also contains many wealthy retirees from London, and it has some very pretty thatched villages, and, uh, and it encourages a lot of tourism and recreational activities. So as in many river catchment areas, there are very obvious tensions between different ideas about what constitutes sustainability for the river catchment. So it reflects very much the ideologies of the newly amalgamated district council, which is proposing in accord with national policy, the uh, major housing and industry expansion to support growth and development in the county with a mantra of creating job opportunities and on the other 
part of the spectrum. You have some hugely committed environmental groups such as the Dorset Wildlife Trust highlighting the multiple species extinctions that have already taken place in the last century and promoting plans to create an ecological corridor running the entire length of the Stour to protect wildlife populations and the health of the river. So within these debates, if we took a reimagined communities approach who would represent the interests of the star and its non-human beings? Where would they represent these interests? How would they represent these interests? Clearly, any effort to represent the needs and interests of a sensible cross-section of non-human uh, communities would have to have some expertise about their needs and interests. So alongside an assumption that social scientists would articulate the issues on behalf of human groups, um, I envisaged a kind of interdisciplinary advisory council, if you like, composed of researchers with expertise on soil, uh, biologists, uh, ecologists, hydrologists, as well as people with local expertise, local knowledge about uh, the, the environment, such as farmers, fishers, recreational groups. And as with any cross-disciplinary exchange of knowledge, this would have to be underpinned by a very strong principle of equality between these diverse areas of expertise and experience. And then the question comes as to how these representatives would fulfill their role. And thinking along these lines takes our attention to a problem that nature culture dualism pertains and pervades the structures of government that actually take care of rivers in theory, and it divides them into very powerful and well supported economic agencies focused on development and growth, and very underfunded and often sidelined environmental agencies who are meant to look after non human interests. And so the emphasis or with the council is always on things like housing, transport, and so forth. Um, and these are activities are intrinsically hierarchical, as is, of course, the academy, and it ensures that the needs and interests of human groups remain heavily prioritized at the expense of those of the non human beings. And so we end up with a situation in which case always overriding the non human needs and interests. So this suggests a need for quite radical structural changes to bring representation for non human interests not just into environmental decision making such as river management but into decisions about housing and transport and energy production and industry all of the things that have very real material impacts on local ecological and regional and global systems so this need for a more holistic approach and the representation and the needs and interests of non-human domain applies in Dorset, just as it would imply in Queensland. And although uh, there, if I was thinking about culturally appropriate ways to do this, I would be thinking about a council also including uh, indigenous expertise. And in fact, there is quite a useful precedent on the Mitchell River, because back when I was working there in the late 80s, early 90s, we established a Mitchell River catchment uh, management group and the indigenous community actually took a lead in establishing this hoping to open up a productive dialogue with other water users up river such as the pastoralists and the national park rangers and the miners and the elders have maintained a co-leadership role in running its efforts to protect the river and they've brought into debates not only beliefs and values illustrating more egalitarian reciprocal relations with the non-human domain but also usefully i think a worldview that integrates all of the areas of life that are so uh, siloed in, in Western thinking and are so divided into specialist areas. So we have there quite a useful model underlying the need for the kind of join up thinking and governance that gets us out of those very specialized silos that maintain a very particular status quo. So to conclude, there are a lot of benefits to be gained from exchanges of knowledge with culturally diverse worldviews and by learning about ideas about indivisible worlds and more integrated ways of thinking, we can conceptually relocate humankind inside ecosystems and recognize that they are shared and co created by other species and by challenging this alienation from nature created by 
assumptions about human exceptionalism, we can develop non-anthropocentric concepts of sustainability that envisage a shared world of living kinds whose needs and interests are balanced in order that all can flourish. And if we adopt a, a non-anthropocentric paradigm, we would encourage the deconstruction of arrangements that currently sustain unsustainable practices. So, for example, the division of governance into prioritized economic agencies and tokenistically supported environmental agencies. And that needs to happen locally with county and city councils. It needs to happen nationally in terms of our departments of governance, and it needs to affect the non-government agencies that operate at an international level. And with that in mind, um, I would suggest that rather than pushing the UN to make a declaration about the rights of nature, I would go further. I think we should move this towards forwards conceptually and promote the idea of a universal declaration of the rights for all living kinds. And there are similar implications for how we think about research and knowledge and expertise. Many researchers work on putatively environmental issues recognize the need for interdisciplinary collaboration, but their efforts remain constrained by the designation of the problem as environmental. And a further obstacle arises from this dualistic divide between natural and social sciences and the subdivision of these into disciplinary areas. And having run an interdisciplinary institute for much of the previous decade, um, I wouldn't want to suggest that disciplinarity itself is intrinsically problematic, because I think that specialized expertise, in-depth knowledge is very valuable. The problem with interdisciplinary collaboration is not that disciplines produce specialized areas of knowledge, but that they work within a neoliberal higher education environment that encourages boundary policing and competition rather than uh, egalitarian and collaboration, collaborative exchanges of knowledge, and which favours with funding and status disciplines that are supportive of neoliberal ideologies and not so much those such as my own that tend to be a bit further to the left and so forth, and more critical of these things. Which brings us back to my original point that models of sustainability are ultimately expressive of political ideologies and interhuman and human non-human power relations. So it's only by achieving social and political equality for living kinds that we can hope to create more sustainable human non-human relations. Thank you very much.